Thank you, Len. Okay, we're gonna switch gears to psoriatic arthritis and ankylosing spondylitis. Uh, this, this field has really um, exploded. I, I know that um, there's just a lot of new treatments, a lot of exciting things going on, and um, you know, getting a lot more airplay at, at the, during the ACR meetings. Um, largely part of, uh, this is a really interest area of mine, psoriatic arthritis, and I find that a lot of the stuff that I read is really borrowed from RA. So it's really interesting now that you look into the literature uh, you know, that they're getting a, a lot more trials just dedicated to, spondylo uh, to ankylosing spondylitis and uh, psoriatic arthritis. So this is just a slide to remind us of how, um, how different um, this disease presents. So obviously a lot of things outside of the joint and um, a lot of um, sort of periarticular structures that we have to deal with, like anthocytis and dactylitis, and how do we manage um, all of these as well as the... Um, uh, other uh, comorbidities that go along um, with this disease. Um, so I've uh, chose a couple of abstracts. Um, the first one's going to be centered around um, IL-17, uh, th uh, th um, which is one of the um, sort of newer findings. I think a lot of the treatment regimens have been um, looking at um, all the differences between the Th1 and Th2 pathways and Treg pathways. And in this field, it's really been exciting um, what we have um, seen. There are both um, uh, IL-17 receptor antagonists and, um, as well as IL-17 monoclonal um, antibodies. So I decided to pick um, secacunumab that was um, looked at in both psoriatic arthritis and ankylosing spondylitis and show you some data around this um, IL-17 uh, mechanism. So the first one I'm going to concentrate is on psoriatic arthritis. So they looked at over 600 patients that were, um, they had moderate to um, severe um, psoriatic arthritis. Um, and as you know, the definitions for what qualifies as moderate to severe is probably not as well characterized as we are used to in rheumatoid arthritis. And they ran randomized them to one of two uh, treatment arms of secacunumab versus placebo. So the 10 milligrams of 75 and the 10 to 150 milligrams versus placebo. Um, and what they did was look at a um, primary endpoint of tender and swollen joints um, as well as um, radiographic um, changes all the way up to uh, week uh, 52. And what um, they had shown some really promising results where secacutumab patients um, had significantly less disease progression from baseline to week 42 compared to those um, that were on placebo. And this was regardless of whether these patients had failed um, anti-TNF therapy or they had concomitant uh, methotrexate use. And what's really exciting is now that we have data out um, to a year is that secacutumab also showed some inhibition of structural joint damage. So this is in psoriatic arthritis. And now I'm going to turn to um, an abstract. Um, oh, but before I do that, so basically this showed that uh, secacutumab um, had um, benefit both clinically as well as with joint structural damage up to 52 weeks compared to placebo. So now using the same uh, mechanism, same drug, looking at um, one-week data for ankylosing spondylitis. Um, and this was a randomized control trial looking at IV and subcutaneous um, dosing. So this is a little smaller study. As you know, AS just affects less people. 300 patients randomized using New York criteria. They had to have a BAS dive greater than four to get in. And about a third of them uh, had been on an anti-TNF um, prior. Their primary endpoint was ASAS 20 a response at 16 weeks, um, and just like the um, other study in PSA and AS, it seems to also be doing um, very well. Um, y there was significant response in both the TNF naive group as well as the one-third that have TNF exposed group. And in patients with active AS, secacunumab provided um, rapid relief in one week. So I thought that was really interesting. So this um, abstract showed that um, patients actually had some difference within a week, um, and then all the clinical parameters improved as well. Um, and when you looked out to um, 52 weeks, um, there were no um, sort of safety signals that, that came out. So it looks, looks promising to date. I thought it would be interesting to show. The data that I don't have here is also the parallel data that's occurring um, in the psoriatic arthritis world with um, psoriasis alone. So they're doing um, equal studies um, a little ahead of uh, psoriatic arthritis and AS. And it's actually showing that um, there are several cases where 
people can clear their skin for you know up to a year. So we're talking about PASI 100. So they use PASI 50, 70, 100. So at the same parallel time as we're talking about the arthritis part, um, please note that the skin part is also doing very well. So this, this is going to be um, a treatment um, to come. So the question I have to you guys is whether or not, looking at this data, you know, where you might fit um, secocunumab in the patients with AS or PSA, and whether or not you think it might be um, sort of used after all your available treatments that you know of now, you know, including TNFs, all the way to do you think it would be used maybe a little bit sooner um, given um, some of the positive effects up to one year. Um, so obviously this is not available yet, and we still have a lot of um, data that we want to take a look at as well as safety data. But um, it's interesting now that uh, you know, in PSA and AS, we probably had less to try, and now as we're thinking about more to try, you think about where you think we're going to fit this in. And so, as you know, a primalast was approved for psoriatic arthritis. Um, the, one of the last um, TNF was also um, approved um, for, for um, AS and PSA. So I think we're um, looking at uh, more and more treatment options um, for this particular group um, with such a heterogeneous um, presentation. So the next set is um, going back to uh, what uh, Dr. Rigby had sort of mentioned about looking at um, any predictors or biomarkers. So um, autoantibodies to 1433N um, has been looked at um, a lot. Um, I could tell you that just scanning the literature um, in RA that this has been shown to have sevenfold increase in established RA patients and six times higher in early RA um, cohorts compared to controls or OA patients. Um, just scanning the literature like the year before, there was maybe about two or three abstracts, and this year there was like 14 abstracts on this. So I'm going to focus on this autoantibody in um, spondyloarthropathy. Um, so this particular uh, abstract looked at this um, this uh, protein is a chaperone protein that's expressed extracellularly. Um, it's to determine, this particular one looked at whether autoantibodies to this protein um, has any sort of prognostic of value to AS patients. So they took about 116 patients with AS. They followed them compared to controls. Um, and they screened them against 1 through 10, which are um, uh, just 10 specific um, sort of uh, uh, autoantibodies um, to this particular um, uh, peptide, they looked at uh, the SPARC score and the MSAS score, which are just, um, one is for inflammation, the SPARC score, and the MSAS score is looking at radiographic pro um, um, progression. Their primary endpoints to see if this protein had a difference um, between AS patients and controls, and whether or not we can predict the inflammatory and radiographic progression in AS patients um, using um, this um, biomarker. So they took, um, in all 10 autoantibodies, um, they have very significant p-value showing that it had a very discriminant area under the curve between AS patients and controls. Um, regarding the, um, then they looked further into inflammation and radiographic progression. So in terms of inflammation, they found that PAN1 and PAN5 correlated best with CRP, and PAN1 correlated best with the um, SI joint MRI, MRI scoring. Um, regarding radiographic progression, they also then um, looked at that MSAS score I told you, a standardized score looking at radiographic um, progression to see if any of these um, PAN1 through 10 correlated, um, and they did um, note that PAN2, PAN3, and PAN10 show the greatest correlation. So what does this all tell us? Um, so there tells us that there's some early evidence that this 1433N autoantibodies um, could be um, possibly used as a novel uh, sort of serum marker in AS versus controls, and that maybe these autoantibodies um, could be associated with um, how much inflammation you might see in MR, how much um, sort of um, radiographic progression an AS patient might have. So this is going on parallel in the RA world. Um, I'm just showing you some new data um, also looking um, in AS. So. Um, so uh, going on the theme of sort of reducing tailored therapy, relaxing therapy, whatever we're going to start calling this, and um, what we should do, um, and I'll, I'll tell you in my practice, this is sort of an academic exercise I do in my head, but most of the time the patients come to me and say, hey, I'm feeling great, I want to reduce, and they're the ones making me, you know, sit there and trying to make that decision of should I let them relax it, should I let them 
um, you know, decrease their, their TNF at this point. So it's, for me right now, it's actually driven by the patients. Um, so I thought I'd look a little more deeper into um, what they're doing in um, ankylosing spondylitis. So this particular study is looking at that question, when your patient reaches low disease activity, can you start reducing your um, anti-TNF regimen? So they took two cohorts, one they called reduce and one they call standard. Um, and they did a propensity matching score, which is great. So it, it does add another level of statistical analysis where they're matching to their age and their disease activity and all the gender and all the confounders that they could think of. Their primary endpoint was to see how they did clinically in one year and then to follow their cost um, over that year. And so here, um, what they're telling us here is that um, both the dotted lines and the uh, solid lines are representing the reduced versus the standard group. And that overall, that their relapse free survival and their adverse event free survival, according to them, are pretty similar. So their question is if they're doing pretty, you know, similar along the way um, and at a reduced cost, um, then their conclusion was that this was sort of safe to do when they were at low um, disease activity. Um, so looking at some of the parameters. So their mean um, change uh, per year over these parameters that they looked at, their clinical parameters was the BASDI, CRP, HACK, and the BASFI. Um, and then they also looked at um, qualities, which is quality of life adjusted years under the curve. And their conclusion was there was no difference between the reduced group after reaching um, uh, low disease activity versus the standard dosing. Um, and then in addition to that, although this was um, a European study, so I don't have exact amounts, but similar to what uh, Dr. Rigby's presentation was, there was a substantial savings per year in terms of um, uh, treatment um, uh, costs. Um, so their conclusion was that for AS patients that reached a low disease activity, this tailored approach um, um, with TNF um, produce similar outcomes um, at one year. This was just the abstract, so I don't have access to all the nitty gritty details about you know um, exactly how long, how they um, decreased, um, but basically their conclusions um, similar to some of the RA studies was that the clinical outcomes was about the same, but really at substantially less um, cost per year. So kind of um, interesting uh, correlate with, uh, corollary to some of the RA um, studies that were presented. Um, earlier, and the question is, now when a patient comes to you um, with this data, are we a little more comfortable to relax them? Is this something that we should be um, really looking or doing uh, more often in, in some of our patients? Um, the next one, switching gears, is over to psoriatic arthritis. Um, so one of the um, big things that we are uh, plagued with in this um, in this disease is that we know they have a significant risk factor before they ever get psoriatic arthritis, and that is having psoriasis. And we know that there's usually a long lag time, um, meaning up to about 10 years um, when somebody has a skin disease before they might start having um, the arthritis part. Now, obviously, some people present, there are a small group that might present concurrently, and there's a small group that presents flip-flop. But in general, there's um, at least an eight to 10 years la um, uh, lag time. So what can we do about that? Shouldn't that be an area that we might look at? Um, is there something in those psoriasis patients that we can do to figure out who um, should be coming to our office sooner? And so this abstract tried to address um, some of the risk factors um, that might be seen in a psoriasis cohort. So this was done um, out in Canada looking prospectively um, at a cohort of patients with just the skin disease um, and uh, following them over seven years. Um, at baseline, they all had a dermatology evaluation and also a yearly rheumatology evaluation trying to look at this. Um, if they had any sort of inflammatory arthritis or spondylo, um, spondylitis at the beginning, they uh, were out of the study. Their primary um, outcome was what, uh, up to at what point did they fulfill what we call CASPER criteria. So as I had mentioned earlier, psoriatic arthritis has, um, has been plagued with uh, sort of more um, you know, indecisive um, uh, ways to diagnose, to classify this disease. So CASPER is sort of a... Um, um, an advancement from the mole and right criteria where they're trying to pick up um, this disease entity a little bit earlier. Um, so CASPER criteria is um, a list. You, first, you have to start with having some inflammatory arthritis, and then you have to gain three points in their list, in their CASPER list. And if you have greater than three points, you fulfill what they call CASPER criteria for psoriatic arthritis. So that was their, their end point. They also looked at different questionnaires, patient questionnaires. They uh, used um, topaz, and if you scored greater than an eight, you were also suspected of having psoriatic arthritis. So they followed quite a bit of number, um, 579 subjects. 
Um, they followed them, um, and about 46 of them actually developed uh, psoriatic arthritis, and nine additional, based on that Topaz questionnaire I told you about, had also the suspected um, PSA. So then they went back and tried to look um, at what these groups, these 46 and nine, um, had in common and whether or not we could find any um, any clinical um, uh, correlations with that. So the annual incidence rate was about 3.7 um, psoriatic arthritis to every 100 uh, per 100 psoriasis cases um, that was um, seen. Uh, some of the variables that predicted um, in this group are written here. So, um, so the location of the psoriasis, um, whether they had nail involvement, uh, and uh, education and obesity seemed um, to be the factors that that correlated. Um, so, just thought it'd be interesting um, in that you know this probably falls a little bit more on the um, uh, dermatology community, but how we can be a little bit better um, since we do have a cohort that's at high risk and what we could do to work together to try to help that uh, cohort get diagnosed with psoriatic arthritis um, sooner. Um. I'm going to talk about latest developments in the development of new agents uh, for uh, systemic lupus erythematosus. Our learning objectives, reviewing newer agents, discussing, discussing interim clinical results, and thinking about actually what we're learning about the pathogenesis of the disease. So now we'll just look at uh, data presented at the uh, recent ACR meeting. So this SM101 efficacy in lupus patients in phase 2A randomized controlled trial. So the idea is that FC gamma receptors are receptors for immune complexes and whether or not the interactions of those immune complexes, like from anti-DNA antibodies, whether they can drive the disease. And we think that that's important. So they actually uh, created a recombinant form of an FC gamma receptor, so it's supposed to bind up all these immune complexes so they won't mess with your cells. And they had a preliminary study. Phase 2A is looking for some kind of efficacy and signal, uh, and uh, it's really a dose-ranging studies most often. So 51 patients with relatively severe disease, Selena Sledive greater than six, so that's, something's going on, and they're randomized, treated for a very, very short period of time, four weeks versus placebo, and we can see over at the right, okay, here. So these are treated with two different doses, six milligrams per kilogram versus 12 milligrams per kilogram, and this is the placebo group. And so they, this is not powered for significance, but a 21% difference is actually on the same order as belimumab, which actually was more recently approved for the treatment of patients. So this is actually pretty encouraging. Um, and they're, they're using a SLE responder index. So that actually is a version of what actually was, was uh, used for belimumab's approval. So this is kind of exciting. Of course, they can't just put this out there and have people figure it out themselves. They have to do a retrospective ad hoc analysis that looks even more encouraging. So they have only 14 patients that have lupus nephritis because that's really, I would think, one of the greatest unmet needs. And all, uh, their patients, even though they divide them up into groups, there's probably three patients here and four patients here, look like they have significant improvements. So that's very encouraging. And more importantly, they were looking for adverse events. They were looking for infections or other things. Four weeks in this kind of uh, level of response is actually very encouraging. As they say, lupus is the graveyard of uh, hopeful drugs, so we'll see what happens next. So don't, we won't decide just yet. Cifilimumab, which I have a hard time with. And so this is a, a 2B study, very analogous. And I have to say that uh, this was a reanalysis of data that was discussed uh, about six months earlier. And they want you to get very excited about the delta. Here's your placebo group that has background agents, and these are different doses, lower, higher, higher. And they're going, look, this is so exciting, you know, 15%. But the problem is, and then they have a more rigorous SRI, this combined uh, responder index. This is whether you have four points change, six points change, and eight points change. Woohoo! Um, but there's no dose response, so it's kind of confusing. So the point is that maybe you'd give even higher and higher doses, but you won't get much out of it. And the question is, is the pathway really central to what's driving the disease? Or is it this just not a great monoclonal antibody? Because you know they have to, they have to place their bets on one agent at a time. 
Um, and they talk about how particularly the patients with mucocutaneous disease did better. Truthfully, they actually excluded everybody with serious renal disease and CNS disease and anybody who's really unstable. So we'll see what happens. People are, uh, there's still a great interest in the interferon signature. It's correlative, we'll see whether it's really causative and maybe it's just this particular antibody is not particularly good. And actually alluding to my multiple, uh, the multiple choice questions, there are 14 different molecules that are grouped within type one interferon and they're very structurally different. So actually whether or not you're really inhibiting the right molecule is really completely unclear. And they're very structurally different, so you may not be able to make one monoclonal antibody that hits them all. So, um, you know, they, they're taking their shots, they're looking for the best mechanism and see what they get. Now, Atacacept superficially was a very, very um, mechanistically attractive molecule. It actually is a, a receptor off of our own cells. And it binds at relatively high affinity both BAF and April, these two, NF, two TNF family members that are B cell survival factors. And so you, you think you get a twofer, that must be better. And so there, the problem was in one of their early phase trials, they co-treated with MMF, and their first couple of patients actually got two things that happened to them. One was that their IgG levels plummeted, and they got serious infections. So you go, well, that doesn't seem like a coincidence. So maybe, so they decided, I get it, it's not the Atacacept, it actually must be the MMF, so let's not use it with MMF. And so now they went back and they reviewed the, the data, uh, a retrospective ad hoc analysis, and it actually, they wondered whether in fact the patients that had the higher levels that they attained in vivo with these infusions had better clinical benefits. And the answer was, in their studies, yes, that looked like there was a, a correlation. Biologically, you attain better levels, your flare rates are reduced. So we'll see whether or not this can actually be brought into practice and whether or not um, background agents can be modified. And it's all in the regimen. You know, they design some regimen, some dose, a dose response. They're, they look at their inclusion-exclusion criteria and they hope for the best, but you can't predict everything. So next I'm gonna talk about this agent, which is a anti-IL-6 monoclonal antibody. Now this is very different from tocilizumab. Tocilizumab is actually an antibody to IL-6 receptor. So it was actually um, invented and created in the laboratories of Kishimoto in Japan, and he was absolutely convinced that antibodies to the cytokine itself would not actually be effective. He actually, in his hands, the, the uh, the half-life and the levels of IL-6 were increased with the antibodies that he tested to IL-6, and he said it'll never work. We have to stop it from interacting with the receptor. So it may have been that those antibodies that day in his lab in that country on a different continent were not representative of all comers, and so now we have different uh, programs to develop antibodies to IL-6, a very, very important inflammatory factor. It is also important for homeostasis. It does a lot of things. Uh, but levels at local sites in rheumatoid arthritis as well as in lupus and a number of other diseases, your joints may be so inflamed that it leaks into the bloodstream. You can measure high levels. How is this actually working in lupus? And here this uh, trial looked at 183 patients. They looked at three different doses and uh, they looked at the dose response. And you can see, in fact, that on one level, this low dose looks very effective, 20% responses, but there's no dose response. It actually even looks lo uh, worse if you get a uh, higher dose. So, you know, this is, uh, I, this reminds me of my wife, I have to say, who is a glass half full person. <laughs> I am not. <laughs> so I'd say, What's with this? We need more information, okay. I won't belabor that joke. Okay, so just to put this into context, so the idea is that, that lupus has complex pathogenesis, and I have to say, uh, if we all think about what they taught us in these ACR criteria from the early 80s, it is completely confusing, you know, why it, it seems more like a Chinese menu than it does uh, something that has a distinct molecular cause. But the reality is that there seem to be central drivers, and really at the center of the disease, uh, we all know, are the autoantibodies, and that these complexes are in the circulation of many patients. 46% have anti-double-stranded DNA, another large percentage have anti-RNA. Uh, we think these immune complexes and the nucleic acids that they have 
are actually stimulants for cells and they interact with toll-like receptors. They only get inside of your cell because they come, they come through the FC receptors that we were just talking about. So the thought is that if we block that stage, maybe this will actually have a very specific effect, but also be relatively safe. So the, that interaction is the source of interferon alpha, we think. There are other dendritic cells that actually make BAF. These are driving more B cells. They live for a long period of time. Immune complexes actually directly get into B cells. And so that we have a number of different pathways, including how there can be induction of IL-6, a very important pro-inflammatory effect uh, that is driving this whole cycle of self-perpetuation. So it's all logical. So in summary, we have encouraging results, uh, not all of them with good dose responses, but new mechanisms that are being examined. Efficacy, it's argued, may be comparable to belimumab, which uh, was kind of a little bit on the, on the edge, but at the same time, we should all appreciate that in more than 50 years, there's only one agent that was ever approved for the treatment of lupus based on randomized controlled trials, right? So in addition, we have aspirin, corticosteroids, and I always forget Plaquenil, hydroxychloroquine. And those are actually the only FDA-approved drugs. And they were grandfathered in. So only one actually made the randomized controlled trials. Difficult to actually win in this game, but we're hopeful that now that we know the path, we can get to success. And the question is whether this will affect your practice. These things are really not FDA approved yet, but we're hopeful for the future. So I appreciate your attention. Uh, I think we've uh, ended this on vasculitis the last few times, uh, and it's a very exciting period of time. We just had a, a meeting of um, uh, Gary Hoffman. We just celebrated his career at our institution. We had some incredible people from all over the world come in and give talks, and it is a very exciting uh, time in vasculitis. So everybody knows uh, 2011 introduction and approval of rituximab for the treatment of ANCA-associated disease. Uh, it's a potent drug, even just treating uh, with rituximab alone, almost 40% of people stay in remission for a year and a half. But after you're done, uh, uh, there are lingering questions. And, you know, what do we do after a patient goes into remission? Do we observe and monitor? Do we retreat? And if we retreat, uh, how much, how often? And um, what about using the drugs that we know that uh, work for maintenance remission like anti-metabolite? So what have we learned new in the past year? I, this is the most important paper to come out in ANCA-associated disease to me um, in the past few years. I've, I've, I've been, uh, I think I've presented this abstract um, uh, at this gathering in the past. So this is uh, the French Vasculitis Network. They've done a lot. It's a little quirky design to it, but uh, basically they said that they would take patients um, who had um, ANCA-associated vasculitis, um, and that could be either um, uh, GPA or actually even renal-limited ANCA-associated, you know, MPO, um, who were in remission after treating them in a standard way, cyclophosphamide glucocorticoids, the way we used to treat it. For these people who were in remission, they then were randomly assigned to receive either rituximab, 500 milligrams, two times, zero, two weeks, and then 500 milligrams, single dose, 6, 12, and 18 months. So you're giving a small amount of rituximab, obviously. And then the comparator group was azathioprine um, in traditional doses um, until month 22. And then, so the rituximab stops at 18, the AZA stops at 22, and the primary endpoint was at um, uh, month 28, and who, who's flaring? And, and they're talking about any flare. I, we're, we're expecting people to be in remission. And here's the data. And rituximab's on the top, azathioprine's on the bottom. You can see this erosion. Um, no matter how you break it down, rituximab was superior. And um, uh, there is a lot of information in this uh, group. Now, on the flip side, if you look at toxicity, um, they're pretty well matched. And uh, we've shown this time and time again that uh, 
rituximab even in this monotherapy, and people are coming off of steroids, um, uh, still have uh, serious infections, and we need to be vigilant about it. Um, so uh, overall, um, uh, it was quite clear that rituximab maintenance remission was superior to azathioprine, and it was a tiny dose. And I've been using this dose a lot over the past three years. Um, the caveats to this study was to get into this study, you were treated with cyclophosphamide and prednisone to put in remission. Would this apply to people that you now treat with rituximab in remission? Um, you know, that, that remains to be seen, but um, some, some people would argue that um, this is a kind of a good extrapolation. So then they drilled into this study and asked uh, a couple questions. So <clears throat> in this study, where most people remained in remission, but some people flared, what factors predicted flares in this ANCA-associated vasculitis? And this is not big news in the vasculitis world, but I'll just cut to the chase. Um, um, there, about a quarter of these patients experienced uh, a major flare, and the risk factors were, and this I thought this was uh, interesting, one, um, if you have GPA, Wegener's, that is a risk over um, having MPO and uh, renal-limited disease. Uh, so obviously, PR3 antibodies is a risk factor because that segregates with, with uh, GPA. Um, having established renal disease um, was a risk factor for relapse. And then interestingly, and I think this is, this is, this is important, um, if you remain ANCA positive, um, uh, so you're in remission and you're still ANCA positive um, at six and 12 months after starting maintenance therapy, this is a, a major risk factor. So if you're PR3 positive and you can't get rid of ANCA, uh, hypervigilance is needed. Whether these people would qualify for more aggressive therapy or not, we really, really don't know. Um, but um, uh, this is consistent with what most data have shown in the world of vasculitis. So conclusion, about a quarter of patients will relapse. Most of them are persistently ANCA positive and PR3 positive. Um, uh, perhaps pursuing rituximab maintenance therapy in these patients would be the most beneficial in a more aggressive way. Um, this is a disease that uh, we don't really know what to do with very much. Uh, this is eGPA, it's called Churg-Strauss, and um, it's a very heterogeneous group of, 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 of conditions. Um, while ANCA is seen, it's not seen in the majority of people, it's actually the minority. And so the question is, you know, what's the role of rituximab in treating these patients? Well, there is a prospective study going forward, but in lieu of that, there is a very high impact uh, study just published in the last couple months on the use of rituximab for uh, eGPA. This is all retrospective. So uh, they took um, uh, patients who had received rituximab uh, as single or repeated courses, uh, identified from four centers. Um, they uh, did a standardized data collection um, and looked at the, um, um, what would represent a flare of disease uh, by BVAS, the Birmingham Vasculitis Activity Scale, um, and looked at uh, the ability to put patients into whole or partial remission. So if you just looked at the patients, what kind of patients were these? Well, you know, everybody's got lung involvement. There's a lot of ENT, um, uh, not very much um, peripheral nervous system. I'm surprised, only 30%, um, and a smattering of other diseases. About half of them were ANCA positive, um, and uh, the other half obviously not. Uh, most of these had biopsy-proven disease. And um, so it was a group of multisystemic diseases, half ANCA positive, a little bit more than what we see, but not much in the way of uh, peripheral uh, neuropathy, exon loss polyneuropathy. So the results of this, um, so they had 41 patients, half women, um, and they classified them as uh, refractory, relapsing, and new onset disease um, uh, as to how they got their disease. So only a few of them had new onset disease. Uh, 19 received single, 22 had received multiple rituximab. Most of these people improved, and in most of these people, they decreased 
prednisone. Um, um, by six months, 83% um, improved with remission in a third. Partial response in 50%, and only a few of them were truly refractory. So how do I take away from this? Uh, in terms of toxicity, the only thing that stuck out to me is that giving uh, rituximab to patients with EGPA, um, the more urticaria and worsening of uh, asthma uh, was seen that what I would a priori kind of think about. So the conclusion of this is, is that EGPA um, resulted in high rates of improvement, reduced requirements of prednisone. So even in the 60% that were ANCA negative, uh, these patients seem to do quite well. This is not a substitute for um, a, a RAVE-like trial for EGPA, but uh, we have a number of patients um, in our center um, on this at the present time. The last thing I'll mention is a little bit of giant cell. Um, and this is um, Gary Hoffman's article. So, you know, so much is going on. Everybody desperately wants to find an infection in giant cell arteritis. And a couple of years ago, a group from Salt Lake City uh, had identified Burkholderia um, as a uh, uh, etiopathogenic organism, and that has never made it into peer review, and um, uh, there are much difficulties. Uh, you know, when you have a lab that focuses on one pathogen, chances of contamination are always high, so they're still working through that. So Gary took a different approach, um, and they took a microbiomic approach. So this is now, you know, uh, looking at um, uh, the microbiome in large vessel arteritis. So they had patients who intraoperatively were going for, um, you know, aortic uh, biopsy and or repair with giant cell arteritis, takiasus, or this what we call focal idiopathic aortitis, the most common form of aortitis. And they had a comparator group of patients who had atherosclerotic um, aneurysms. Um, they took these sterile um, uh, intraoperative specimens um, and uh, examined them uh, microbiomically. Uh, so, you know, the, the big world of microbiomics of 16S ribosomal um, uh, taxa uh, analysis. Um, and then uh, subjecting this um, to um, shotgun sequencing. And it was very interesting. Who the heck thought you're going to find anything in these aortas? And uh, uh, they uh, compared the aortitis and the non-aortitis, and quite clearly by cluster analysis, these two um, 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 patient groups uh, uh, were separate. Uh, in the abstract, uh, they looked at uh, some of the major taxa and uh, made some comments about uh, the, the, uh, uh, the diversity patterns. But I throw this out uh, as um, um, demonstrating that large vessel vasculitis does not appear to be sterile, um, uh, and they have quite different uh, patterns uh, of uh, microbiomic um, display uh, based upon inflammatory versus non-inflammatory um, uh, disease. So this is, this is truly a story much, much closer to the beginning than the end, and uh, they are now pursuing further analysis uh, to uh, really drill down in an informatic way uh, to describe these microbial com uh, communities um, and see how they can possibly relate to uh, pathogenesis. So, interesting story. Second last uh, abstract, uh, which I think is now, this is the put a fork in it. Um, this is uh, adalimumab uh, as a steroid sparing strategy for patients with giant cell arteritis. Um, you don't have to be a statistician to interpret this graph, uh, nor this graph. Uh, that there is no um, uh, evidence whatsoever, and it, you can add this to the previous randomized controlled clinical trials in both GCA and PMR of failed uh, therapy with etanercept, infliximab, and now adalimumab, 
So it's certainly back to the drawing board, um, and now we await the pivotal tosilizumab trial, uh, trial, which is now fully enrolled, um, and uh, perhaps in a year uh, we may be seeing uh, the first bit of data for that. So I'm going to stop here and. Uh